There is one simple idea in cooking that you will learn right now that is so powerful and far-reaching that it opens up all techniques and cuisines to be mastered. But you won't find it in any cookbook. Oh no, that would be too straightforward and it makes me question all of my spending on these cookbooks. I've bought them all though because cooking is a uniquely human activity and a really rich subject that sits in this space between art on one hand and science on the other. So it is a big ask to compress all of that into one book. And one man did that 30 years ago and not just to one book, down to one chapter and in the end, one sentence. So what are we waiting for? Well, I'm waiting for you to like and subscribe. Then we can continue. Okay, I trust you, let's go. The book is The Curious Cook by Harold McGee and we're looking at chapter 17, From Raw to Cooked. The practice of cooking has changed in recent years through the understanding that scientific analysis has brought to it. But the hangover from millennia of cooks winging it and trying to see what works just through trial and error is still with us and there's a lot of bullshit floating around some of which is useful bullshit, but bullshit nonetheless. Harold McGee, perhaps more than any other person, was instrumental in helping to cut through it. And his book on food and cooking is one that I know a lot of chefs have or have read. And it was crucial in Heston Blumenthal developing his ethos to question everything. What it was for him was the notion that searing meat does not seal in juices, which was the commonly held belief up until the 1980s. He also revealed why copper bowls are so good at whipping egg whites compared to any other metal bowl or glass. <laughs> Clearly in the pockets of big copper. But for me, chapter 17 in his follow-up book is the one that is his biggest contribution. Its deep insight is so groundbreaking that I'm going to overlook the use of Comic Sans MS in the text. And here again, McGee was groundbreaking. When this was written in 1990, I imagine Comic Sans MS was a cool and exciting font before it had been abused by rubbish newsletters, church groups, and The Sims. And chapter 17 starts with the question, in what appears to be a stylized Adobe Kazlon Pro, why do we like our foods cooked? Well, he puts forward a few potential reasons. Number one, cooked food is easier to chew. It's easier to digest and it is more safe virtue of being cooked and killing off pathogens. We outsourced our digestion and therefore we didn't need as big a jaws or as big a digestive system, which reduced our energy requirements and made us more efficient. Now this would certainly have caught on as an adaptive behavior owing to the obvious advantages of being able to outsource these really energy demanding processes we have to do but it doesn't necessarily explain why we enjoyed these foods to begin with. These, were, these would have been novel flavors that we didn't have experience with. And the reason here surely is they were delicious. Now in the book, McGee quotes lawyer cum gourmand Brillat Savarin. And he says, the creator, while forcing man to eat in order to live, tempts him to do so with appetite and then rewards him with pleasure. Number two, which is that the detection of these molecules was nothing new. We we're already familiar with them. And indeed, the detection of small compounds is the most primitive sense. And it is the precursor to taste and smell, which even bacteria to this day use to communicate and sense their environment. And again, the molecules in cooked foods are the same as some of these original communication molecules. The, the molecules that we sense are evocative of our evolutionary past. And following on from that, number three, raw foods are chemically simple when it comes to aroma and taste. They contain many large molecules like proteins and carbohydrates and fibers that we can't detect as taste or smell. And that comes with one exception, which is that ripe fruits, including apples, bananas, raspberries, and even truffles contain hundreds upon hundreds of aroma molecules. And they are in the frame of what we can detect with our noses and our mouths, chemically complex. Number four, McGee looks into the chemical composition of foods and notices that the Maillard reaction, for example, as well as cooking over fire, produces chemicals that are found in fruits. And the fifth and last point is, when we cook foods, we break down large molecules into smaller ones, and these create a chemically complex space when it comes to aroma and taste, it's typically containing from three to 800, sometimes into the low thousands of aroma molecules. Now each of these is produced in small amounts, but combined they are characteristic of the food or the technique in which you use, say for like making a caramel or roasting beef. 
So those are the reasons why Harold McGee suggests that we enjoy cooked food when food tastes good. But what about when food tastes bad? Well, in that instance, it tends to be because there's one overwhelming flavor. That is when the dish is dominated or we perceive it to be unbalanced and there's a lack therefore of complexity. Now, if you'll allow me to make a hypothesis, this might be because it's an evolved response. Now, things that are poisonous tend to be poisonous with just one chemical. They contain a substance that is there in a relatively high concentration and it's designed to kill. Now, nature isn't at all wasteful and you don't need to kill someone twice in two different ways. So once it's evolved one molecule that does this, it's done. And so perhaps perceived complexity, where there's no overwhelming note or molecule, is a proxy to say, this food is probably safe and it's not trying to kill me. So a quick chemistry lesson for us here. Now we're not gonna go in deep, we're just gonna go in enough so that I can make the key point, which is this. There are very few ways that you can actually put atoms together in a stable way in nature. You can't just join atoms together any way you want. And those that try to do it at undergrad level fail chemistry. There are rules that need to be followed and that's a good thing because when you have rules, you have structure, you have order. Without them, you'd have abject chaos and life could not have evolved. Luckily then, atoms are orderly and they form stable groups such as these. It doesn't matter what they look like. I just want you to have a grasp of the number which we're working with here. It's not that big. And the point is this. When you break up these large carbohydrates and proteins and other structures of a plant or animal, there's only so many ways that they can break down. There's only so many small molecules that are stable. And it's no surprise that when you break them down, you end up with the same chemicals that are in fruit. It's kind of like if you were to demolish a house or if you were to demolish a library or a school, you would end up with, in each case, bricks, window panes, window frames, wires and pipes. They're all made of the same things. So the dice are very much loaded when you heat these foods or cook them using another process like fermentation to producing molecules that we already find in life. Which leads McGee into a quote from Marcel Proust in this chapter. And the orange squeezed into the water seemed to yield to me as I drank, the secret life of its ripening growth. Countless mysteries unveiled by the fruit to my sensory perception, but not at all to my intelligence speaking to the vital nature and information in small molecules and to the ethereal nature of perception and deliciousness. McGee ends the chapter with, heat transforms our foods by enriching their flavors tremendously and by evoking at some level different foods and different times. In a sip of coffee or a piece of crackling, there are echoes of flowers and leaves, fruit and earth, a recapitulation of moments from the long dialogue between animals and plants. And even more simply, and for me the most important idea in cooking, all cooked foods and indeed all chefs aspire to the condition of fruit. Now truly understanding and practicing this idea is a lifelong pursuit to be able to produce at will the perception of complexity and I don't think it's one that you ever finish learning. Now this idea of deliciousness being a result of perceived complexity is one that underpins and supersedes all other ideas and guides in cooking whether it be flavor pairing or anti-pairing, if it's flavor bridging, or even what tastes go well with what. This one underpins all of it. Our tools to achieve this include roasting, fermenting, smoking, and aging. Now McGee wrote this book over 30 years ago, and we're wasting time. So what are you waiting for? Go and cook.